Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you for joining our live webinar today. Comprehensive Technologies for Quantitative Analysis of Cell Physiology. My name is Jason Villagomez, Marketing Manager at Nanian Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's event. In today's webinar, we are joined by Ronald Knox, PhD, Scientist and Account Executive of the Cardiac Site Flex Site Team in North America at Nanian Technologies, and Laurier Boyer, Professor in the Biology and Biological Engineering Departments at MIT joined alongside Vera Kaladova and Kirsten Schneider from the Boyer Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But before we get started, I'd like to go over some due diligence ahead of today's proceedings. Upon completion of the presentation, we'll hold a live Q&A session with the presenters and as such welcome you to submit questions at any time throughout the course of the presentations. You can log a question in the chat window found on the right hand side of your screen. You can address questions to me in the chat box or post an open question to the chat by selecting send to everyone. Your message will be then added to the queue and will be addressed upon completion of the presentation. If you happen to experience any technical difficulties at any time, please inform us via the chat box as well. Additionally, today's presentation will be made available on demand shortly upon completion of the event, inclusive of a transcribed copy of a Q&A session. I will now turn over to Ron for the start of the presentation. How's that? Perfect, I can see your slides well. I'm gonna go and meet now. Okay, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. And uh, a huge thanks to Lori and her team for putting together this webinar today and inviting the community, MIT and others to hear more about um, the diverse array of technologies that Nanian has, but also very importantly, the additional value that the technology that's in Lori's lab at the moment has beyond the use of just simply on cardiomyocytes, because as we understand, there's many diverse interests up there at MIT, with different cell types and different disciplines. So that's the purpose of today. So I split the uh, presentation into four little sections. So if we move forward. So let me just very quickly tell you a little bit about Nanian Technologies, who we are. Uh, the company was formed about 20 years ago. We're headquartered in Munich. Um, and th this slide shows that we have a very diverse array um, of products, um, ranging from automated patch clamp instruments shown here. Actually, I need to use my pointer settings. Hopefully you can see my pointer now. Um, so this instrument called the Porta Patch was the first automated planar patch clamp instrument on the market. Um, and very recently, this was actually uh, being modified into this very cool and compact instrument called the Porta Patch Mini, which is incredibly versatile. It can travel anywhere and you can put it in a backpack. So it's great for collaborations um, and, 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 and so forth. Um, we also have uh, automated patch clamp instruments such as the Patch Limer, which is medium throughput, all the way up here to our flagship high throughput screening patch clamp instrument known as Synchro. Patch 384. In addition to the patch clamp instrumentation, uh, we also have bilayer recording technologies known as the Orbit family, shown down here on the left. Um, and these are great instruments for studying uh, reconstituted ion channels in lipid bilayers. Um, uh, and in addition to that, we also have technology uh, known as solid support membrane-based electrophysiology, and this is ideal if your interests are in studying the properties and functions of electrogenic transporters. And of course, uh, what I'll talk about today quite a bit is the technology that's in Lori's lab at the moment, um, is our cardio excite and flex site um, instruments for studying um, cell impedance and true contractility of cardiomyocytes. Um, so these are the two systems, as I said, that are in the lab up at MIT at the moment. Um, so essentially, this is our system, the, the base system, the cardio excite. Um, it actually um, is environmentally controlled. Uh, this lid um, is fed by air and CO2, um, and it's also heated. So this is a benchtop instrument, and, and it basically allows you to do both impedance measurements of contractility and also measure fuel potential measurements, electrophysiology measurements. And as 
is very important to this audience, and I'm going to get that get to this later on. This instrument can be used for far more than just studying the responses and phenotypes of cardiomyocyte cells. And of course, um, this is the Flexite, um, which is one of our uh, latest technologies. This is a unique technology where we're using growing cells on a flexible membrane substrate and high throughput, um, and allows you to study cardiomyocyte function. Um, and contractility under conditions where we believe that cells are more mature than under normal standard conditions. Um, so in this slide, um, you see over here on the left-hand side, uh, this shows you the benefit of what the cardiac site allows you to do. You, it allows you to measure both um, fuel potential responses shown here on contractility, as well as, as I mentioned, true contractility. Uh, which we get from the add-on of the Flexite module. And you see so quickly here how my colleague in the lab over in Munich basically transfers one of these housings to the ele electronic base. Um, and these housings have different sensors. So that's how quick, literally seconds, you transform being able to do cardio excite measurements to be able to do Flexite measurements. Skip this slide, for extra time. So um, the point I would like to make here, so um, we have used the Cardio Excite. We have been working with many different partners um, to characterize and look at the phenotypes of their individual cell types that they sell. And what is interesting, and just so as you can, if you take a look here, is the profile of the cardiomyocytes, both in terms of what you see here, fuel potential measurements, and then the larger um, contractility measurements, the footprints are different from cell to cell. And this is important, but we have worked with all of these people to develop protocols and characterize the cells. And this is the same with all the cells. So for example, the in-house cells that you have at MIT and elsewhere, we spend time developing, understanding the assays. Um, but for all of these commercially available cell lines, this has already been done um, by us, and these protocols are available. Um, so I'm not sure how many people are aware of uh, the SIPA initiative. Um, essentially, this um, is a project uh, that has been carried out by a combination of folks from industry and academic labs all over the world. And the idea was to try and come up with assays that were more predictive of proarrhythmia. Um, as the gold standard is simply still at the moment for getting FDA approval of therapeutics is HERG assays, patch clamp assays. So the idea here is we wanted to, the, the, the communities wanted to try and find much more predictive in vitro assays that would help predict the clinical translation um, and be able to identify toxicities um, of compounds through the drug development process. And we have participated at multiple levels. Um, we have Dr. Sonia Fix, um, who is part of the steering committee and the Ion Channel Group. And we've also contributed vastly to the Nanian community um, generating the patch clamp data with our patch liner synchro patch, and of course, um, the phenotypic assays that we run on the cardio excite. Um, the other part of this initiative is a lot of the patch clamp data that is produced by these high throughput screening platforms is fed into modeling studies um, so that you can get, again, get a better understanding how mixed effects on multiple line channel types become very important for producing the end product, and which is the phenotypic effect of the therapeutics on, on the, the, the function of cardiomyocytes. Um, so what this slide shows is the, the, the benefits, the vast benefits of taking a holistic approach uh, to try and understand uh, what's going on um, at the level, at the phenotypic level of the cardiomyocytes. Um, and so what I show you here on the left-hand side is data collected on the cardioic site. Um, and we're showing the effect of this uh, kinase inhibitor. And you can see that application of the inhibitor produces this arrhythmic um, ectopic beats, uh, 
both when you look at the EFP, the fuel potential measurement, and also shows you, you start to see these changes when you measure the contractility through the impedance response. And what's really nice is then you can we we can use our high patch our high throughput and medium throughput patch clamp devices to go on and characterize these molecules further and understand mechanism of action. And in this case, you can see that this kinase inhibitor um, was a very potent blocker of the Herc channel, and also um, significantly inhibits the sodium channel NAV 1.5. So overall. Um, getting a more holistic view of mechanism of action um, is a big part of what uh, the CIPI initiative is trying to do. Um, this slide is an interesting one. So this particular compound here, so fosipuvir, it's a hep C, hepatitis C antiviral compound. Um, and amiodarone, as most people will know, is an antiarrhythmic compound used to treat ventricular tach tachycardia in the clinic. Now, when these drugs are taken alone, um, patients are fine. Um, however, it was noted that um, in the clinic, when doctors were doing ECGs, that when these compounds and patients that were taking these compounds together, um, there were significant clinical abnormalities in the contractility and in their ECG recordings. And the beauty of these in vitro experiments, because again, is that carried out in like the cardiac site 96, as you can see, like this clinical data seems to track well and translate with what we see in these in vitro experiments. So these compounds alone um, don't really have any effect on contractility or the fuel potential, but you can see here in combination, they produce a profound and drastic reduction in contractility when they're given together. So you see this dissociation between excitation contraction coupling only when the two compounds are evaluated. And I believe after this study was actually published, um, there was warnings and, and changes made to the way that clinicians would prescribe or wouldn't prescribe these two uh, compounds in, in combination to patients. Um, another nice example um, of why it's very important to look at both um, impedance contractility and fuel potential measurement is shown here with this myosin kinase 2 inhibitor, blebstatin. You can see if you look at the um, fuel potential measurements shown here on the right, there is very little or no effect over long periods of time, whereas there is a very rapid and profound inhibition of contractility. And so again, having this ability to measure both of these parameters on the same instrument at the same time in the same cells, it really allows you to dissect mechanism of action, which is a big advantage um, of this system. I want to switch now quickly to the flux site. Um, shown here um, on the left-hand side is the classic Langendorf heart, which is still the gold standard for measuring uh, uh, therapeutics that are potentially going uh, for development uh, to see if they have any impact on uh, cardiac contractility. Obviously, it's very, it comes with a lot of issues. Low it's, it's actually low predictive, and that's not too surprising because the species differences between the animals that, that we, that are, whose hearts are used for these experiments. Um, it's very low throughput, and it's labor intensive. Um, so the Flexite instrument that we're going to talk more about today and is in Lori's lab, um, this is the driver to try and invent something new that would help um, address this issue. Um, and what we see here is um, if we compare the flex site to the Langendorf heart, there's major advantages to our high throughput flex site contractility platform. Uh, first and foremost, you don't have the species issues that you have for transla translatability. Um, the throughput is clearly much higher. Um, and you can make multiple measurements um, using flex site and cardiac site relative to simply measuring just contractility in, in the low throughput models. And very importantly, genetic disease modeling with stem cell derived cardiomyocytes from patients, et cetera, um, can be studied thoroughly um, in a system like the flex site 96. Um, so, what we see here 
um, is essentially a little video. Uh, I can play that for you guys. I mean, well, it's not playing for me right now. Anyway, the point is this is essentially showing us um, how the Flexite 96 works. Um, so we have these ultra thin membranes that the cardiomyocytes are plated on, and this is looking at them from the bottom. Um, and essentially how the assay works is when you have the cells plated and medium on top, that hydrostatic pressure um, bears down on the membrane. Now, once a nice monolayer has been formed and these cells begin to contract, um, the cells pull upwards and away from these sensors showing shown here in these little purple circles down here. So they, those sensors are measuring an electrical, a capacitive electrical measurement um, that is emitted by um, the top half of this sensor here, this orange part. So it's a high frequency capacitive current. And then whenever there's a change in the distance between the sensor and the membrane, we're actually measuring the contractility of the preparation. Here in a little a bit blown up version of it, this is what it looks like. Um, so essentially the benefits, this is what the consumable looks like. Um, and, and, and it does two, the two main things that it does is um, preside, pr provides like mechanical conditions that are more akin to what you would see in vivo in the heart. Um, and, and, and so that again, allows what we believe and what all the data suggests is to produce a more mature phenotype in the cells because they're in a more physiological environment. And also we can now quantify the contractile force directly, which is um, there are no other high throughput uh, um, technologies that we are aware of that are doing this at this point. Um, here is just, again, how we compute this, uh, uh, the contractile force. It's very simply the, the tension on these membranes um, it's calculated from the Laplace equation. Um, so all of these parameters here are measured. And so we can get a direct readout of contractile force um, and high throughput. Okay, so on this slide, what I'm showing you on the left-hand side, this essentially what we did was a literature search comparing um, different uh, human engineered heart tissue preparations. Um, because they also use this output of contractile force measured in millinewtons per square millimeter. Um, and what we found was, and again, these are, a lot of these are complex 3D systems. Um, they're, again, low throughput assays and they're qu quite technically challenging to work with. But what we found with the Flexite, again, and we believe it to do with maturity, is that um, the contractile force that we see if we wait long enough in the flexite preparation, it's very comparable to what you would see in some of these more complex, organized 3D uh, um, heart preparations. And so that's very re re reassuring for us. And again, underscores what we can do with this uh, based on its high throughput. On the right-hand side, what I show you, what people have been looking for for a long time is that um, what you want to see in your cardiomyocytes is that over time as they mature, because these are indicators of maturity, is that the beat rate would drop. Um, and um, when the beat rate comes down, what you want to see is an increasing con contractile force. And so people have been waiting for techniques that could show this um, in vitro for a long time. And so being able to show this in high throughput assays um, is very important. Um, another example um, of how we feel that um, the flexite is very important in terms of uh, maturing cardiomyocytes is shown here. If we just focus on here um, for adult cardiomyocytes, and this is a, basically an optical method for measuring muscle contraction and the velocity of contraction. So you can see here, that again, if we look on the right-hand side now at the data that we, that we record in the flexite, uh, both the contraction here and the velocity of the first derivative are very, very analogous to what you see in these adult cardiomyocytes, 
which can be produced with these very low throughput um, um, assays. So again, this was very encouraging for us to see. Um, another uh, example of uh, maturing the cells, the surface really matters. We did some nice experiments here where we plated cardiomyocytes um, on cardioexcite plates and also on flexite plates. And we took advantage of electrical pacing. Now that's a technique that a lot of people are use that try, and, and the reason they use it, they're trying to mature their cardiomyocytes. So again, in the cardiac site, um, if you uh, electrically pace the cells for 48 hours or more, you can actually detect um, positive inotropic effects of compounds like isoprenaline, as shown here in green. Whereas you don't see that um, if you know if you're not stimulating electrically. But also, what was really nice is that without any stimulation, um, plating the cells on the flexite plates. Uh, you can readily detect a very robust concentration dependent increase um, in, you know, contractile amplitude and force uh, on these flex site membranes. Um, so on this slide, it's kind of busy, but just want to focus you on a couple of things. So in addition to the isoprenaline, we, isoprenaline, we also tested a number of different types of um, Compounds, so for example, these positive inotropes like the calcium channel opener, BK, and then this compound, Omcamtiv macarbil, it's actually been very problematic in the field for people being able to demonstrate its positive inotropic response, responses in, in, in these uh, uh, in vitro assays. And so it's very nice to see on the flex site uh, that we can readily detect positive inotropy of Omcamtiv, uh, which is um, um, a myosin activator compound and that this compound is actually in the clinic. So those were acute effects um, that I showed you on the flex site. These are now uh, what you can do, and which is really nice, is you can look at very chronic effects of compounds or any other sort of therapeutic modality treatment using flex site. And this is not always true. So for example, this is a compound here, erlotinib, and it's one of these kinase inhibitors which is used clinically, and it's not known to really have sort of cardio toxicity. Um, and then this is borne out with the in vitro data we see on the flex site. So over prolonged periods of time, at concentrations uh, well above the Cmax that you would see in, uh, in human patients treated with this compound, you don't see any um, significant change in the contractility of the cardiomyocytes. On contrast, this other kinase inhibitor uh, which is known to have liabilities associated with um, cardiovascular liabilities, it shows up um, showing quite um, potent um, um, uh, yeah, inhibition of contractility in the flex site assay. Um, and similarly, you see, see these time and concentration dependent effects of uh, anthracyclines like idorubicin, which readily show up in, in, in the flex site assay as well. So um, now I've got to a part of the talk that is very important because one of the things that Laurie said people wanted to hear about in your community was what else can you do with these compounds beyond cardiomyocytes because a large part of the academic community are not working on cardiomyocytes, so it makes sense. So um, again, here's the instrument. So one of the things, the base impedance measurements that you can make on our instrument, the Cardioxite 96, um, can be deployed very nicely to measure a number of different types of assays, such as cell adhesion, you can look at cell proliferation, et cetera. Um, so once you have any cell type, you know, whether it's a cancer cell, hepatocytes, et cetera, they come to feel con confluency um, on the electrodes uh, when you're measuring the impedance, and then you can then interrogate, once you, once you have that nice monolayer, um, you can, study experiments uh, where you can look at things like cell detachment, uh, loss of tight junctions, and then you know, look at all sorts of um, membrane effects from membrane receptors, et cetera, that actually alter the phenotypic responses of the cell. Um, so the instrument also very nicely, we're using it uh, to do uh, spectral impedance measurements uh, without getting into too 
great technical detail. So instead of just measuring the impedance at one frequency, what you can do with the instrument here is run a spectrum of different frequencies. And the reason this is important is because depending on your cell types and the types of assays that you're developing, the relevant information um, um, might be determined by measuring the impedance signal at a different frequency. Um, so for example, here in this middle panel, um, you can see uh, that, in, although it's a cartoon, the idea is within this one to 10 kilohertz range of impedance frequencies, the signal is dominated by this paracellular current flow. Whereas up here at the higher frequencies, 10 to 100 kilohertz, uh, you start to see a more and more pronounced introduction of um, sort of transcellular or capacitive cellular effects um, on the impedance signal. And this schematic on the right hand side just shows this in cartoon form. So low frequencies, paracellular and high frequencies, transcellular effects. And so the idea here is that um, there, there are many different types um, of assays um, and all different types of cells that can be carried out on the platform. So if um, you, if you take the data uh, you showed before, simply here, if you're looking at the response the impedance signal when you have cells on it and, and, and no cells on it, and you divide there and calculate the ratio, you get curves that look like this. And the idea is that um, you can actually then look at an, um, the sweet spot and determine for your particular cell type, for your particular type of biology and phenotypic acid that you're working on, what is the best frequency to make your measurements. And so this technology does this very nicely and is being used um, to work in areas such as uh, cell signaling pathways and virology for looking at um, uh, interference assays and you know, determining uh, cellular invasion, again, cell proliferation, barrier function, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very, very uh, broad capability that this instrument will allow you to do um, way beyond just looking at the contractility properties of cardiomyocytes. Um, just as another example here, um, again, I like to show this because, again, this is a nice use of spectral impedance to study GPCR signaling pathways. So, for example, you can take lots of different cell lines. There's no overexpression. These are endogenous, and endogenous expression levels of a GPCR, and you can treat them pharmac pharmacologically and see these very characteristic impedance um, profiles, um, which reflect the inhibition and activation of different GPCRs. And again, what is really nice about this technology, again, it's non-invasive, there's no labels, and you can do very long-term experiments um, rather than just acute experiments as well. Um, another really nice use of, the, the, of this technology is, for example, shown here in the left-hand side, Again, these tremendously chronic experiments. So for example, um, this data shows this uh, breast cancer cell line, HNN8. Um, it's uh, taken from a biopsy for a patient here. So you can see the time course and the development of proliferation um, of these cells. And then you can do experiments like is shown here where you can actually take cells that have been modified and treated um, by uh, you know, pharmacological treatment, and then you can see that the growth rate of these cells is very much slow and retarded um, compared to the cells that were not. Again, the important thing here is this very long term and the dynamic nature of these measurements, so they're not endpoint measurements. Similarly, if you look at cells like hepatocytes, you can do these very, very long experiments over time. Um, um, and look at the, you know, whatever parameter you're interested in, in this case, it's hepatotoxicity. But again, you're not using endpoint assays. You're not just looking at small slivers of time. You can look over vast amounts of time and see the dynamics of how your compounds or how your manipulations are changing the properties of the cells. Um, this is a, a particularly nice uh, set of data that we 
used in comparison to look at impedance recordings um, versus the more classical sort of ATP-based assays for, for hepatocytes. Um, and so what was done, again, you can do these very, very long-term experiments over 260 hours of recording and look at dose-dependent effects of compounds on different types of hepatocytes. And then, so we've done that and compared this so that so you can compare the inhibitory properties of the cells with conventional short-term assays that involve labile substrates like ATP versus the IC50s that are generated with the long-term impedance experiments. And you see a very nice correlation, but you have that added bonus that you get to um, monitor your cell experiment continuously and dynamically over very long periods of time, which you know, can shed light and um, lead to very interesting findings that you might not otherwise be aware of. Um, this slide here shows very similar data, but, um, only these are like uh, um, these new iPSC-derived hepatocytes um, from uh, Fuji CDI um, that we were working with in this collaboration. Um, and again, very similar long-term experiments, chronic experiments. And what's really nice here, this now uh, combining the iPSC-derived hepatocytes with the technology allows you to do like disease modeling. So you can take like, you know, patient-derived hepatocytes with mutations or with various, you know, phenotypic abnormalities and compare them relative to white wild type, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now I'm going to touch briefly on some of the other technologies that we have at Nanion. And so this would be auto automatic, automated patch clamp technologies. Um, so our company was founded upon automated patch clamp, as I said at the beginning, 20 years ago. Um, and the big massive breakthrough of the whole field at the time in patch clamping was like transforming this highly laborious, expensive, and difficult technique of manual patch clamping um, into a highly scalable and automated process that can be conducted very quickly and easily without extensive amounts of training. And that's what's shown in these cartoons here. So essentially you get, you eliminate all of this complex equipment, microscopes, Faraday cages, et cetera, et cetera, it's skill training, pipette pooling, and all of the things that go into patch clampers, and patch clampers will appreciate this, the people who have done it, manual patch clamping, um, to this much more simple process um, of doing planar patch clamp. So in terms of that, um, so we have uh, th these patch clamp devices that come in all levels of throughput. I mentioned at the beginning, here's our Porter Patch Mini which is fantastic. Um, we have this our patch liner instrument, which does our medium through experiments, incredibly versatile platform, and our, really, and our newly introduced flagship, our high throughput screening, uh, synchro patch 384i uh, platform. Um, for this audience, and the point I wanted to make with this slide is, so this is automated patch comping, but yes, so this platform, and it goes for all of our platforms, he's been validated in dozens and dozens of different types of ion channels. Voltage-gated ion channels of all different flavors, sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, inward rectifier, chloride channels, ligand-gated channels that are involved in the nervous system and neurons, uh, sensory neurons, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of these cell types can be um, studied very nicely. Um, um, on the synchro patch at very, very high throughput. And as I mentioned, yep, it's validated in more than 60 different types of ion channels. Um, now, so one of the very nice parts of this synchro patch technology is the fact you can also run it in what we're calling 32 well mode. And so in an academic setting where you're not screening millions of compounds like pharmaceutical companies or running, you can actually use our consumables for this in blocks of 32 and, and, and essentially running 32 wells at a time. And so then, you know, you're getting all of the cost savings associated with, you know, high throughput assays. Um, but you don't have to run through 
and you know use up thousands and thousands of plates the way it's done in you know sort of biopharmaceutical companies who are screening large one million compound libraries etc cetera, etc cetera. so this technology can has been easily customized and is ideal and can be utilized very nicely in an academic setting and that's what I was trying to um, impart by but by from this slide and like I say, what is really nice about this, you, you run your 32 wells with your cell line or your primary cells on it, and you're done. You do your assay development, and then you just carefully take, you know, clean off the consumable, put it back into the vacuum sealed bag that it came on and put it back in the fridge, and then you bring it back out when you're ready to do a different set of experiments. So again, um, the consumable cost this way is a lot more suitable um, for the type of work that goes on in many of the academic institutions. Um, I would be remiss without showing you some nice data from the synchro patch. And so I just selected um, this particular set of data. Um, these are actually, uh, again, from cells that are derived. Uh, these are um, from iPSCs and the glut glutamatergic neurons. And the point I just wanted to make is that so even though there are neurons that uh, you know glutamatergic neurons derived from iPSCs, um, you can uh, run very nice experiments where you can measure potassium channel activity as shown near these outward conductances, sodium channel experiments, um, and you, here shown here like pharmacology, we can take tetrodotoxins to blow up so sodium currents. So the message here is that, so this is not just an instrument for screening cell lines. It, it's actually being used now for studying, uh, like I say, uh, neurons de de derived from iPSCs, but also primary cortical neurons, et cetera. And people are now working very hard on doing signal patch measurements with, uh, with actual sensory neurons. So with that, um, Oh, I have this one last slide where I wanted to show you. So again, if you're interested in selectivity profiling and you're the type of people who are working on multiple different types of ion channels in your laboratory, um, you can take like the synchro patch. So for example, here, these are like six different ion channels um, that are important in cardiac function are part of that SIPA panel uh, that I, I talked about a little bit earlier. So in like one experiment that would take like maybe an hour and a half from start to finish, you can measure the activity of compounds um, and six different ion channels all in parallel. Um, and to be honest, I, I, I can't even begin to think how long it would take to do this using manual patch clamp. But again, very versatile um, technology. Um, and again, if you're an ion channel lab or um, a lab looking to get into studying ion channels, this type of technology is definitely something that you would be interested in. So I think that was my last slide, Jason. Perfect. So Thank at this point, um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ron, for the overview. Uh, Kirsten, I can now see that you can unmute yourself and uh, go into your screen share mode. And the floor is yours. I'll just confirm that I can see your audio and see your slides. All righty. Can you hear me? Perfect. I can hear you and I can see your slides. All right. Excellent. So I'll go ahead and get started then. All right. So uh, my name is Kirsten Schneider, not Lori Boyer, though I work in Lori Boyer's lab here at MIT Department of Biology. Uh, our lab is broadly interested in the developing heart. Um, we're interested in the mechanisms that drive cardiac cell fate decisions and how faulty regulation of that leads to disease. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Vera Kolodova, and I have been working with the Cardio X site and Flex site for about a year on various projects. And for this presentation today, I'm just going to go over a couple of the ways that we have used these platforms in the Boyer lab. All right, so um, I mentioned we work with cardiac cells, specifically cardiomyocytes, and we can learn any number of things about these cells in various ways, whether that's large scale experiments like genomics, 
metabolomics or chromatin accessibility um, or other ways. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's important to remember that cells do things, cells have function, and we need a way to measure that. For cardiomyocytes, it's that those cells are excitable and they contract. So at the end of the day, our hope is to not only describe these and quantify these functional properties, but hopefully get at the molecular mechanisms underlying any pathological changes we observed, um, which I'll do in the next couple examples. So for my first example here, I just wanted to give you an example what, what, what we're able to get from this device, just in a very plug and play manner. So the iCell squared cardiomyocytes are a commercially available source of iPSC derived cardiomyocytes, human cells. Um, and how we use this is that a postdoc in the lab named Alex Ald had identified a metabolic enzyme that affects sarcomeres and other structural proteins in cardiomyocytes. So one way to approach the, this question was to in, knock it down with siRNA which we did on the cardio X site shown here, and look at how we're able to quantify any functional differences. So what we see here is that this mean beat is, and the parameters we extract from it um, is consistent with increased contractility, which adds another piece of the puzzle to the other observations we've collected. Uh, so the point of this is just to say we can manipulate cells on platform and monitor the response. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I mentioned that we care about cardiac development for which it might make sense that we need a dynamic system, something that allows us to access the early events that happen in that cardiac development. So uh, Vera and I work to develop protocols for on-plate differentiation of various pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes for both the flex site and X site. And I don't believe that this capability existed before our work. So I'm very pleased to see that we were able to do this and succeeded. So this next experiment I'm gonna tell you about, we inducibly degrade a cardiac transcription factor starting in the mesodermal stage in mouse ESC differentiation to cardiomyocytes. So we're treating with a compound DTAG13 that degrades this cardiac transcription factor that turns on very early on in development. And let me just show you what happens here. So first, these are the cell cardiomyocytes we've differentiated on plate on the flex site. You can see they all beat together strongly, synchronously, lifting up the membrane, which is what we're able to measure, their contractility. But in the cells where we've been degrading this transcription factor while they develop, you can see that they have a very severe asynchronous beating phenotype. So this is just an illustration that, of course, transcription factors are typically required during certain times and places during differentiation in the process of development. And if they're not, things can go awry, as you see in this ex in vitro example. So I just wanted to show you, if I can advance the slide, uh, the results that we gathered using this instrument. So here for the flex site, uh, you can see a dramatic reduction in amplitude in our degraded transcription factor condition, and also uh, a good increase in irregularity as the cells, as you saw yourself. And we can monitor how these cells are developing, maturing, contracting more over time. For the cardio X site, I'm just showing you the extracellular field potential results here, where we also see a reduction in amplitude and increased irregularity. But there's also some uh, features of this EFP trace that are very interesting to us. So some of the things we see is a reduced sodium spike, um, reduced amplitude, and a prolonged repolarization phase in these cells. So this is all something that is abnormal, electrophysiologically speaking, and it's consistent with arrhythmia. So let me just go back to this video really quick here so we can see again at our beautiful cells. Um, you can imagine these are cells on a plate, right? And if this was a heart, that heart would be quite dead, which is what other people have observed that it is embryonic lethal in the mouse. Um, and we really think that these electrophysiological mechanisms get at why that's happening, that it's a defect in the cardiac conduction system. 
the, and that's something that we've also observed in our larger gene expression chromatin data as well. Um, and this last panel here, I just wanted to point out that this phenotype is specific to developing cardiomyocytes. You have to degrade this transcription factor early to get that. So if we do it at the mesodermal stage or the progenitor stage, vastly reduced amplitude excuse me, vastly reduced amplitude and arrhythmia, whereas if they're already cardiomyocytes and they've already developed their conduction network appropriately, we don't see this as much. So this is all just a nice way of getting at the mechanism and a role of a transcription factor in early cardio development that we've done. So that was mice. Uh, we are also interested in humans in this lab. Uh, so we have a particular disease line in lab that has a mutation associated with, highly associated with congenital heart disease. So we went back to the drawing board, or in this case, the tissue culture hood, and developed another on-plate differentiation system for these IP human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, uh, which we succeeded in doing for the cardio site. So here I can show you how these cells look normally. You can see they're a bit more robustly contracting. They tend to do so earlier. And as we monitor this over time on the cardio site, you can see enhanced contractility. So what we think, what we were interested in doing and mapping out this phenotype early on is that it gives some indication of perhaps some sort of early maturational pathological phenotype, which we're also seeing in terms of other, other measurements like early cell cycle exit and other changes. So this gives us, this method gives us an insight into human development, which might be otherwise very difficult to study. So that's all I have for today. Um, we're happy to have everything up and working. It's been a pleasure to use this in our various projects and experiments in the lab. Um, hope this gives you just a taste of what we've done. Uh, I've shown you that we have quantified the functional difference in both mouse and human systems, and that we're currently expanding our capabilities to cardiac spheroids or more organoid-like models. And we're hoping that this can help under, uh, advance our understanding of cardiac biology, as well as perhaps personalized medicine in the future. Thank you very much for listening, and please do contact us if you have any questions at all. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Kirsten, for giving us an insight into what you're working on uh, together with Lori and Vera um, in her lab. So I'll open the floor to some questions now. Um, I've received some directly, but do please feel free to write in the chat if you have any questions for either Ron and Kirsten. Uh, Ron, a couple questions for you. Um, do the flex site and also the cardiac site plates allow long-term monitoring of cells? Um, for example, like over weeks, maybe you can comment a little bit on this. Yeah, sure, Jason. Um, I mean, the short answer is yes. So long term monitoring on both types of plates is definitely possible. And what's really nice about our consumables, there is no degradation of the sensor electrodes, like on the cardiac site plates. And I think that was borne out quite nicely when we look at the very long-term data that we, you know, see both in cardiomyocytes, but also in hepatocytes and other cell types, you know, the tumor cell lines, for example, that people study using the platform. And also the same is true. Obviously there's no electrodes, but on our um, flexite plates, uh, we can keep them cells and culture on the, flexite plates for a couple of months at least and, and 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 you know beyond that probably more so yeah definitely um long-term monitoring is very possible with with no de degradation in the sensor quality that we are aware of yep okay and then another question uh, for you ron that came in through your talk uh so when you looked at automated patch comes specifically a synchro patch does the synchro patch allow to have different temperatures uh, within different deck positions? Right, uh, Jason. So, so yes, and 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 you know, for people who are maybe not so much uh, electrophysiologists, like you know, temperature control is very important in shaping the responsiveness and the biophysics of ion channels. Um, 
So what what is a very nice feature of the synchro patch is that there's 12 different positions and each one of those positions can be uh, readily controlled individually from the software and you can set the temperature anywhere between 10 degrees and 37. So yes, uh, that is definitely possible. And it, it's also possible in our patch liner uh, instrumentation uh, to do temperature ramps because the solution change um, is very, very rapid with the laminar flow across the cell being recorded. So you can actually in real time look at uh, temperature sensitive ion channels using that thought form. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Ron. And uh, Kirsten, a question for you. Um, again, thank you, Kirsten, for the nice presentation. Have you tried looking at ion channel effects that are due to the transcription factor effects on manual patch or automated patch? Uh, in addition to the long-term changes in impedance and EFP? Sure. Um, so we primarily use the cardio excite and flexite in our lab. So we have not done patch clamp recording on these cells. But um, that's a great question. And we would expect from the EFP results that there is something going on in the some sort of ion, defective ion channel. Maybe it's missing, dysfunctional, whatever else um, that's contributing to them not being able to establish that cell-to-cell -cell electrophysiological talk. So um, we would definitely like to go further in detail uh, to look at what particular ion channels are responding to this transcription factor in this cues. One thing I just want to add, if you don't mind, um, and so we can use ion channel blockers um, on these cells and compare the uh, functional output to our uh, mutants, and that also helps to give us some clues into what the perturbation might uh, be in terms of ion channels uh, for these experiments as well. So that's been really useful. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Laura. And then, Ron, another question. Maybe you can comment on um, how the synchro patch is used uh, within academic labs and also uh, within industry. Do you know if this technology is being applied? Um, in the pharmaceutical industry or also with CROs and also within academic labs? Yeah, Jason, sure, yeah. Um, so the, the folks at Nanion, we've looked at the distribution of usage um, for things like the synchro patch um, between academia, pharma, and CRO companies. And what the data tells us is that approximately a third of these systems, I believe, are in academic labs. So you know, 33%. Um, and then, so I think part of that is like the low running costs and also the possibility to run the system in this 32 well mode is probably responsible for that. Um, we're seeing that more and more. So, you know, again, I think there's a nice split, right? So, you know, you've got like 30% academic and then the other systems, like I say, and I, I think they're split fairly evenly between pharma and CRO companies who are doing high throughput screening. Uh, but the other thing is very attractive to the academics now is that the, the synchro patch and also the patch line, uh, they're so amenable to doing current clamp measurements. Um, and that allows people, for example, who are working on neurons um, of any description, whether it be you know neurons in the brain or sensory neurons, um, and also cardio, cardiomyocytes, you can record the action potentials, which is clearly the phenotypic output that you're really interested in within these cell preparations. Um, and so there's a lot of really nice validation going on, uh, both at Nanion and with our collaborators in that area. And again, that's something that I think is very exciting to the academic community, knowing that they could uh, deploy the technology in that way as well. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ron. So sure. with that, um, I'll, I'll close out the session. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Ron, uh, Lori, the members of Lori's lab, um, Kirsten and Vera for giving us a little bit of insight into uh, what they're working on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I will make a, a copy of this available for those that weren't able to attend. I know that uh, we probably took some of you uh, your lunchtime away. So we hope that this was very informative for you. And if you have any questions for either Ron or Lori and um, Kirsten and Vera, please do feel free to reach out and I'm sure they're happy to tell you more.
Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are. All right. Take care.